Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon again, folks. Welcome to another episode of Spilling Tea. I'm your host, Tiffany Daniels, and we're going back to that horrible world known as the JRC. But before we do, the usual disclaimers, and we're just going to shoot straight into it because I'm just tired of having continuous conversations over and over and over and over and over again. Especially about ableism, people first versus identity first. Just, I've been having these conversations. We're tired, folks. We're tired. God, treat us like human beings and don't demonize us. And stop torturing us. God, y'all act like it's such a horrible burden to treat us like human beings. Not you all who watch this channel. You get where I'm coming from. All right. In the description box, folks, you're going to find a link to the article that the Judge Rotenberg Educational Center doesn't want you to read. It's written by Neuroclastic, a small non-for-profit started by autistics for autistics, wherein they interviewed and surveyed over 900 ABA professionals in regards to the JRC's so-called behavior modification program. Matter of fact, the JRC doesn't want you to read this article so much, they've threatened Neuroclastic with a defamation lawsuit if they did not remove it from the website. Neuroclastic has refused, so you all know the drill. Please read that article and share it on all your social media. Also included in there is Neuroclastic's public statement regards to the defamation lawsuit threat, as well as a link to their GoFundMe. We are crowdfunding in case the JRC actually sees through with their threat. Also included the Ozarks' first article in regards to the Agape Boarding School, now known as Stone for Help Boarding School situation, a so-called Christian-themed boarding school based out of Stockton, Missouri, that takes in so-called troubled male teens that has in pending over 21 civil lawsuits, claims, and allegations leveled against it, all which have been substantiated by the Missouri Department of Social Services, and they include the following, sodomy, rape, sexual assault, child abuse, psychological and emotional abuse, child trafficking, starvation, and that's just for starters. You have one former staff member arrested by the FBI, another a doctor, who still lives on the premises with full access to the boys up on multiple, again, substantiated claims of sodomy, rape, and sexual assault of the boys there. You have an attorney general too busy chasing after drag queens to actually do his job, and you got him trying and failing to defund public libraries as well. And a governor, God help our governor. Woo, he's special. Real special. So please, folks, read that article. Share it on all your social media. We got the other pertinent links to the Stop the Shocks campaign as well, including Autistic Hoya's massive archive on the subject. Jennifer Masamba's behavioral sheet of shockable offenses. A clip out of the seven-hour ordeal undergone by Andre McCollins back in 2002. The templates in the ever-present self-explanatory change.org shut the Judge Rotenberg Center down petition. When we discuss the JRC, you're going to hear vivid descriptions of and catch clips of surveillance footage of peoples with disabilities being tortured and abused. If you got young children present, folks, please use your headphones, all right? Trigger warning, this channel is marked not for children for a reason. We use profanity on occasion. We speak on dark subjects. If your child is 16 and younger and they are watching this, very obviously, parental supervision is very much advised, all right? All right, folks, where we left off, remember, this is a professional evaluation done by an individual who has way more letters behind their name than Dr. Matthew Israel ever have. It came back out in 1999, well over a decade ago. We're talking two decades here. So let's go ahead and get into it, shall we? In a sense, applied behavior analysis underwent a revolution in the 1980s. What have I told you guys on this channel? Right here. It moved from behavioral treatments based largely on manipulation of consequences, i.e. use of reinforcers to increase behaviors and punishers to reduce problem behavior, to a new wave of thinking that examined the environmental ideology of the behaviors as the driving force behind the selection of treatment procedures, Mason Roberts, 1993. This move away from manipulation of consequences, especially punishment, is evident in the literature across the field of psychology and special education. 
Dr. Murray Sidman, scientist and author of the classic book, Tactics of Scientific Research, a book that is considered the Bible of behavior analysis, published another book in 1989 called Coercion is Its Fallout. In his foreword, Dr. Sidman explains, I wrote this book to say some things I have long thought but needed to say not just to professional colleagues, but to all thoughtful people who are concerned about where we are going as a species. In this book, Dr. Sidman defines coercion as the use of punishment and the threat of punishment to get others to act as we would like. Dr. Sidman describes the effect of such procedures. Before we get into that, to me, it's very obvious. It's manipulation 101. It sets us up for predators for life. But let's read on, shall we? With addition of every new p- punishing element of our environment, however, our lives become potentially less satisfying, more desperate. If we encounter p- punishment frequently, we learn that our safest course is to stand, pat, and do as little as possible. We congratulate ourselves for every day that passes without catastrophe. The only things we are eager to learn are new ways to evade or to destroy objects and people that stand in our way. The process is potentially explosive. When we are punished, more and more elements of our environment become negative reinforcers and punishers. We come more and more under coercive control and rely more and more on counter coercion to keep ourselves afloat. There's another thing that's not being talked about here that I'm going to bring up myself because I've dealt with it myself. There are also those of us who've undergone this to some extent, whether in official capacity or not, who get angry as we get older. Very angry. In fact, we become downright vengeful for how we've been treated. When you're in that capacity, when you finally understand what has been done to you, and that anger comes, it's destructive, folks. I was an alcoholic on and off for a good long time. Part of the reasons why was I was trying to suppress that anger. And underneath that anger, the grief at how I was handled by teachers and others. It was about burying it almost, so I didn't have to deal with it. But then there came a point, even with the alcohol, that you just can't suppress when you hold that kind of anger and rage inside of you. Eventually it will, as I've said on this channel, it will come to a head. This is why so many of us in the neurodiversity movement are trauma and abuse survivors. So many of us later in life, turn to self-medication. If you want to know why I don't demonize Depp for drug and alcohol abuse, it's because he's very much not alone within his neurotribe of doing it. I did it. Many other autistics, ADHDers, and other people part of the neurodivergent movement have done the same. There are consequences. And it takes years of therapy and a lot of not being willing to give up to be able to finally, once you come out of that self-medicated haze, be able to confront and deal with the types of things that come out that are the fallout of stuff like this doctor is mentioning here. But let's move forward, shall we? There are many side effects of punishment. The side effects of punishment often can have considerably greater behavioral significance than the hopped for, sorry, hoped for 
Main effects of suppression of behavior, yet punishment and other forms of coercion have continued to be used without adequate testing. The environment where punishment occurs becomes punishing in and of itself. The school becomes a place of punishment and not an environment for learning, growth, or nurturance. Makes you fear school, not go, oh, yay, goody, I get to go to school and be tortured. Nobody says that, literally no one. I get to go to school to learn how to create a mask. Nobody says it. It's exhausting. It's exhausting to create it. It's exhausting to embody it. Just saying. Further, the people who implement the punishment become conditioned punishers themselves, eliciting the same reactions as does the actual punishment. Thus, teacher and staff represent punishment, not education. We fear them, not listen to them. There is a difference. Although punishment does not seem to do the job, the problems and emotional suffering that result later take great amounts of effort and money to resolve, like I said. And these side effects must be counted as costs. Also, for those of us who self-medicate and all the doctor's bills and crap and therapy that we have to go through, not just because of the damage that led to the addiction, but for the fallout of the addiction itself, those bills start stacking up, folks. You can trust me on that one. A major outcome of this change in focus in applied behavior analysis is that the intervention for the disruptive behavior of one student might look completely different than the intervention developed for the topographically similar disruptive behavior of another student. Further, this means without information related to the environmental etiology of the behavior, an effective strategy is not likely to be developed. Again, those are real fancy words for what I've been saying. Man, the Missouri came out of me, but to simplify it, that means the underlying issue that is triggering the behavior goes undealt with. Positive behavioral support is a comprehensive, empirically derived behavioral technology with emphasis on understanding the problem behavior and building skills and capacity in the individual to more meaningfully and competently participate in inclusive, natural, community-based settings. The use of positive behavioral supports has been articulated in the Individuals with Education with Disabilities and Education Act, the IDEA. I've done previously, if you want to look towards my first videos, a whole entire thing on the IDEA is how you can utilize it, particularly in protection of your disabled kid. So please look those up. You'll have to scroll. I'm sorry. I'm not the best with technology. But there's a lot of resources on IDEA, especially parents. Get your hands on those. Study them. Memorize them. Be able to see them when you go to sleep at night. Trust me on that one. The IDEA states that the functional behavioral assessment and positive behavior support should be considered when behavior support is developed for children with disabilities. In effect, these amendments codify positive behavior support as an expected standard within the field of special education. Expected, folks. Expected. And it gets changed as it develops every single year. And most definitely within the behavior support provided for students with severe disabilities, Horner, Albin, Sprague, and Todd, 2000. The following sections provide an overview of the two important components of this technology and discuss X's program within the context of these components. So we're going to contrast and compare JRC's insanity, which against what was being used at the time of the late 1990s. It's going to be a ride, folks, because it's going to be very vastly different to what we've been coming to expect from the JRC. So take a moment. I'm going to go ahead and close out on this. We don't get very many views on this channel. The few that we do get do tend to get removed from time to time. So please don't forget to hit the like button, hit subscribe, and don't forget to hit the comments. I do appreciate your time. And as always, folks, we here at Smelly Tea do hope you have. A good one. I'll see you next time.